L'Envoy. Footnote. Closing the second volume of the London edition. Go, little book, God send thee good passage. And specially let this be thy prayer unto them all that thee will read or hear, where thou art wrong after their help to call, thee to correct in any part or all. Chaucer's Beldam Saint Merci. In concluding a second volume of the sketch book, the author cannot but express his deep sense of the indulgence with which his first has been received, and of the liberal disposition that has been evinced to treat him with kindness as a stranger. Even the critics, whatever may be said of them by others, he has found to be a singularly gentle and good-natured race. It is true that each has in turn objected to some one or two articles, and that these individual exceptions taken in the aggregate would amount almost to a total condemnation of his work. But then he has been consoled by observing that what one has particularly censured, another has as particularly praised, and thus the encomiums being set off against the objections, he finds his work upon the whole commended far beyond its deserts. He is aware that he runs a risk of forfeiting much of this kind favor by not following the counsel that has been liberally bestowed upon him. For where abundance of valuable advice is given gratis, it may seem a man's own fault if he should go astray. He only can say in his vindication that he faithfully determined for a time to govern himself in his second volume by the opinions passed upon his first but he was soon brought to a stand by the contrariety of excellent counsel. One kindly advised him to avoid the ludicrous, another to shun the pathetic. A third assured him that he was tolerable at description, but cautioned him to leave narrative alone, while a fourth declared that he had a very pretty knack at turning a story, and was really entertaining when in a pensive mood but was grievously mistaken if he imagined himself to possess a spirit of humor. Thus perplexed by the advice of his friends, who each in turn closed some particular path, but left him all the world beside to range in, he found that to follow all their counsels would, in fact, be to stand still. He remained for a time sadly embarrassed, when all at once the thought struck him to ramble on as he had begun that his work being miscellaneous and written for different humours it could not be expected that any one would be pleased with the whole but that if it should contain something to suit each reader his end would be completely answered few guests sit down to a varied table with an equal appetite for every dish one has an elegant horror of a roasted pig another holds a curry or a devil in utter abomination a third cannot tolerate the ancient flavor of venison and wild fowl, and a fourth of truly masculine stomach looks with sovereign contempt on those knick-knacks here and there dished up for the ladies. Thus each article is in condemned in its turn, and yet amidst this variety of appetites seldom does a dish go away from the table without being tasted and relished by some one or other of the guests. With these considerations he ventures to serve up this second volume in the same heterogeneous way with his first, simply requesting the reader if he should find here and there something to please him to rest assured that it was written expressly for intelligent readers like himself, but entreating him, should he find anything to dislike, to tolerate it as one of those articles which the author has been obliged to write for readers of a less refined taste. To be serious, the author is conscious of the numerous faults and imperfections of his work, and well aware how little he is disciplined and accomplished in the arts of authorship. His deficiencies are also increased by a diffidence arising from his peculiar situation. He finds himself writing in a strange land, and appearing before a public which he has been accustomed from childhood to regard with the highest feelings of awe and reverence. He is full of solicitude to deserve their approbation, yet finds that very solicitude continually embarrassing his powers 
and depriving him of that case and confidence which are necessary to successful exertion. Still the kindness with which he is treated encourages him to go on, hoping that in time he may acquire a steadier footing, and thus he proceeds half venturing, half shrinking, surprised at his own good fortune, and wondering at his own temerity.